AP U.S. History, Lesson 30, The Modern Era, 1920 to 1929. Now, when we talk about the modern era, you've probably heard it referenced quite often as the Roaring Twenties. We're going to talk about what makes it called the New Era, the Modern Era. That'll be an important component in our lecture. And the first part, we're going to look at uh, we're going to look at the preliminaries, the transition from war to peace and political normalcy, as well as economic growth, which were key hallmarks of this era. Well, World War I initially had left the United States as, at its end as the dominant economic, financial, and industrial power on the globe. All the others were either destroyed, like the Central Powers, or were dependent on the United States in some way. They owed us money or uh, had needed our assistance. Politically, though, the United States withdrew. We backed away from the world scene. We rejected the League of Nations. We rejected internationalism, focusing instead on what we called isolationism or normalcy. And along with this, in many ways, progressivism is in decline. The idea of reforming. We talked about this pendulum going back and forth. The pendulum which had swung so far towards reform had seen all that reforming zeal burn itself out, extinguished in the battlefields of World War I in a hail of machine gun fire. And as a result, we'd seen Americans come back from the war saying, this whole reforming thing, changing the world, making it a better place, not for us. And that trickled down into home as well. The 20s are not going to be an age of institutional domestic grassroots reform at state, municipal, national, or federal levels. It'll be more of a swing back towards the laissez-faire model of the time that predated the progressive era, being the Gilded Age. This is the nature of this pendulum-like or cyclical-like uh, process of reform and then reaction, counter-reaction to reform that takes place. So to begin with our post-war transition from war to peace, as the economy begins to move off of war footing back onto a peacetime footing, um, there's all sorts of demobilization. All the military men are coming back home from the war, and war industries close. Government contracts are canceled, and it begins to be this process of reconversion back to peacetime. Initially, this process is sort of disjointed. You have people coming back without jobs, and new jobs haven't been created for them yet. So you have a lot of inflation. Um, the fact that war industries are closing, and the, and the men coming back from war means that blacks and minorities are losing all their war jobs. So they're the last hired, first fired. And there's not a lot of consumer goods yet. So few consumer goods, plus a lot of people who want those goods, supply and demand thing is going to mean inflation. You've got a lot of high prices, people with cash, not much to spend it on. And so you see labor disputes resume. The National War Labor Board is terminated with the end of the war. And the two most famous strikes in this era immediately after the war, the 1919 police strike and the national coal strikes in coal and steel that also took place in 1919. All of these strikes end in failure for organized labor, which is not unlike what we saw in the Gilded Age, and it sets a signal for the time. Calvin Coolidge, in fact, the uh, governor of Massachusetts, breaks the Boston police strike by saying there's no right to strike against the public safety any time, any, time, any place, anywhere. And in so doing, takes a zero tolerance approach towards unions and organized labor. We'll see labor decline a lot during this era. More on that in a bit. The other problem that comes out of this era is the issue of patriotism. To whip up the nation to the war fervor, to the patri patriotic fervor they needed to, it led to an intolerance of diversity by 1919. At that point in time, the population was anti-immigrant, anti-labor, anti-communist, and anti-radical. And so it's not a very far trip from I love my country to I love my country a whole lot to I love my country so much that if you don't love it in the exact same way I do, you're not a good American and should be punished for it. And that's where we are by 1919. The uh, so-called Red Scare or Fear of Communists, the other name for communists would be Bolsheviks, comes out of this time period. Remember, at this point in time, the old Imperial and Russian Empire has collapsed and Europe itself is in a real state of transition and there's a fear of communists or anarchists could come over and try to infiltrate American thinking and destroy our capitalist free market way of life. Uh, the Palmer raids led by Attorney, Gen Mitch, Attorney General A. Mitchell Palmer wound up being the national response to this. The government reaction was uh, mass roundups and arrests of individuals with very little justification. These are violations of civil liberties. As we had said in earlier units though, tie this in, civil liberties tend to diminish during wartime. And of course, this is carry over the period immediately after the war. So there are all sorts of arrests of people based maybe on what they believed, not what they'd actually done with little or no justification. The highest example of this would be the uh, Sacco and Vanzetti trials of the early 1920s, where the two defendants were tried in all likelihood more on the basis of their nationality and beliefs than whether or not they'd actually committed a murder they'd been, approved, they'd been accused of. They were two Italian-American anarchists, uh, immigrant anarchists. The race riots that you saw in major cities like Chicago in the early 1920s period as well showed this simmering tension. Remember we'd seen in World War I the great migration of all sorts of African-Americans north to work in war industries. Well, 
Now the white soldiers are back, want their jobs back, and also don't really want these African Americans around them in urban areas. So we find out that racial tension is not something just for the Jim Crow South. It's something that plays out in the uh, segregated society of the urban North as well. Beyond that, though, to national politics, Warren G. Harding campaigned for the election of 1920 as a rejection of the League of Nations, a rejection of internationalism, and a, uh, a repudiation of all that Wilson was attempting to do. And he called his campaign a normalcy, getting back to an America that was not comp uh, compelled and focused on European and international concerns, focused on domestic ones. And he saw his uh, presidency as not just a counterpoint to progressivism, a counterpoint to all the reforms of the earlier era, of which the war to end all wars was a culmination, but as an isolationist, pro-business, laissez-faire style of government approach that the people were, uh, were, were pushing for, the people were electing for. And it included numerous components. Among these would have been some things that are sort of reactionary, things that are counter to the reforming things we'd seen in the progressive era. The Underwood-Simmons tariff of Wilson, which is a decline in the tariff, that gets jacked back up. Why? Because the protective tariffs of the Gilded Age were tariffs that were high. Business in America liked them. Corporate interests liked them. And as such, they're harder on the consumers because so they pay more. But corporate America likes the protectionism. And so we see high protective tariffs, which have the side effect of making it difficult for the rest of the world to trade with us. More on that later. Uh, the American plan, which was an anti-labor stance, it was the anti-closed shop plan. Union enrollment dropped significantly during this period as many corporations and businesses refused to hire union workers. In fact, they'll even do what was called paternalistic capitalism or welfare capitalism. They'll give their workers kind of nice benefits in exchange for saying, don't ever join the union. So it, they're designed to have this independent thing. Unions are seen as somehow un-American, Bolshevik, uh, sort of collectivist, sort of communistic in their own way. And so it's a big period of uh, breaking unions. Secretary Treasurer Andrew Mellon in supply side economics, which references trickle down economics, the theory being that you cut taxes on industry, you cut taxes on the wealthy. By the way, the richest classes in America praised Mellon as the greatest Secretary of Treasury since Alexander Hamilton. And remember Hamilton's philosophy. Hamilton felt from way back that three classes of Americans were destined to rule the nation the rich, the well born, and the able. So Hamilton being praised as the best secretary since Hamilton by the elite classes shows you who these policies benefited. The theory of trickle-down or supply-side economics is that you cut taxes on the wealthiest Americans and then they will spend or invest that money and that money will trickle down, trickle down to the lowest elements of society. Obviously it benefits the wealthiest, the first, and the most, but it is, it is the policy of the time of these Republican administrations. Charles Dawes, as a head of the new, newly established Bureau of the Budget under the Republicans' administrations, focused on keeping budgets low, keeping budgets balanced, keeping government expenditures minimal, keeping government intervention in programs in the economy minimal. And this was through cutting government spending, cutting government programs, reducing government debts, all ways to diminish the role of government, which is sort of what the Gilded Age was about, if you remember back. Uh, prior to the Progressive Era, government sort of being a free market system, government not, not having a role in that free market system, kind of staying on the side and out of that, letting corporate America do the things that corporate America is going to do. Ultimately, Warren G. Harding is a lot like another Gilded Age president, even though he's not of the Gilded Age, he's like Ulysses Grant. Grant himself was not politically corrupt or dirty, but many of his associates were. Harding's so-called Ohio Gang of Associates sought to come to Washington, also in this new Gilded Age money-making model, to sort of enrich themselves. They abused their government positions for uh, personal gain. The biggest example of this was the Teapot Dome scandal of 1924, where corruption reached the highest level of government as the Secretary of the Interior sold oil leases to corporate friends and associates of his for which he got a kickback of, uh, of petroleum, or petroleum money and gains on that. This came out just after Harding's untimely death. Now with his death, Vice President Calvin Coolidge assumes the White House, and Coolidge is going to clean up the scandals, which is good. And there's two revealing quotes about him that tell you about his administration. His administration was very much a pro-business administration. Two quotes that are very revealing. He's the guy who said, the business of America is business. He's also the guy that said, and everyone's heard that quote, it's probably even in your history textbook. Another quote that not many people has known that he said is, the man who builds a factory builds a temple. The man who works there worships there. Which gives you some idea of the plane or level upon which business people were seen in the 1920s. They were seen as heroes of the age. And in fact, uh, Bruce Barton, 
writes a book entitled The Man Nobody Knows in the 1920s, talking about Christ, Jesus, as the ultimate businessman, because based on his teachings and his 12 apostles, he was able to build Christianity, the Catholic Church, the longest enduring business organization the world has ever known. In a sense, was, that was Barton's interpretation, at least. So we see in many ways the businessman is the hero of the era, not the worker, not the union laborer, not the reformer, not the organizer, not the progressive uh, activist, but the businessman. And so as such, he minimalizes debt, taxes, and regulation. And otherwise, government does not have a particularly active role, other than very meticulously watching to make sure they're not getting too involved in the economy. Let the economy run and regulate itself. And the initial results of this seem to pan out, because there's initially economic prosperity. After initial conversion back to post-war, uh, or back from wartime to post-war goods, the economy, or the economy prospered. Production rose, met consumer demand, workers got higher wages, they got more money, and industrial efficiency increased. So-called Fordism or Taylorism, scientific management studies, the factory, the assembly line, um, mass production of standardized quantities of goods um, to become more important and affordable. Public projects on roads increase. In the 1920s, Americans spent more money on buildings and roads than anything else. And so we see this sort of internal infrastructure development go along and college and business education increasing as management occupations rise. So we are at the beginnings then of a consumer society. And we'll talk about more about this in our second half. The idea that much of what we call modern America, much of what you know as modern American society and culture and even our way of life emerges in the 1920s. It's a pro-business laissez-faire economy with cheap petroleum and cheap electricity. Electricity for all the consumer goods, petroleum for the automobile, which is going to transform American life completely. There were, however, some limitations on this. For farming, the Great Depression is not going to begin in 1929. It's going to begin in 1920 with the end of the war. During the war, the government had set price controls in place to guarantee farmers a profit, and the government needed as much crop grown as possible. Remember, food will win the war, was one of the rallying cries. And we needed food for our allies and food for the troops. When the war ends, all those government price controls, all that government uh, stabilization in the rural agriculture markets goes away, and farmers are left with too much excess capacity. They had mechanized, we'd seen the tractor during this period, we'd seen vast overproduction, and after the war, many farmers uh, couldn't pay on their leases, they left with the heavy burden of debt, and new technologies like fertilizer and the tractors, they either had to pay for those, or once they had them, it didn't help because all they did was produce more. So we see that productivity served to actually increase their debts, and we saw farmers thrown off the land more during this time as these surpluses produced falling prices. As for uh, union setbacks, the open shop, the idea of keeping jobs open to non-union workers, really sets union labor back during this time. Union labor declines by 20%. So organized labor and rural America both are not seeing good times during this era. It'll be a sign of more difficult things to come in the economy in the uh, dirty 30s or the 1930s after the stock market crash. But the second half of our unit is going to focus largely on cultural and social phenomena in the 1920s as we focus and emphasize this idea of modernism or the modern era.